Thank you for joining for another robotic abdominal wall reconstruction operation. Uh, today we're going to be talking about robotic transabdominal transversus abdominis release. I think this is the operation that many of us look at as the ultimate in abdominal wall reconstruction with contemporary approaches. So a 66-year-old woman, multiple surgical interventions, large chronically incarcerated ventral hernia, Surgical history notable for sigmoid colectomy with end colostomy for diverticulitis, a colostomy re reversal, and then multiple C-sections. <clears throat> she presented to me suboptimized for a reconstruction with a BMI of 44, actively smoking, and a, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, and we were able to optimize her over six months and set her up for surgery. So let's look at her cross-sectional imaging. Uh, you'll notice that the upper abdomen uh, doesn't have much in terms of any hernias, but then quickly around uh, M2, M3, we transition to a large 17 centimeter wide hernia, multifocal hernia, with hernias within hernias, I like to call them inception hernias, containing colon, small bowel, and omentum. <clears throat> she had evidence of good compliance of the abdominal wall with the saggy lateral sign and the sunken rectus sign. You also notice she has uh, somewhat of a hernia around her old ostomy site on the left side. <clears throat> and then that uh, secondary hernia that she has there made it such that I wanted to set up the operation to initially start on the right side rather than the left so that I could hopefully dissect out anything that was incarcerated in that sac and assure safe dissection throughout. So we were going to do a transabdominal approach uh, and double dock with our initial right-sided docking. So I'm starting with the case, lysis of adhesions. For this case, this took about maybe two hours, a lot of dense adhesions all across the midline and lower abdomen, uh, about 30, 40 minutes of dissection, and we finally were able to start seeing the rim of that second hernia within the hernia. Uh, fortunately, the adhesions at this point were actually nice and easy to take down. <clears throat> and so we carefully dissected out what was incarcerated colon uh, away from that sac. You can see us pulling on an epiphyllic appendage here and reducing the colon. This is really satisfying a large volume of incarcerated contents here. And clearly, if we had gone left side dock first, we would not be able to approach this. So speaks to the importance of reviewing your CT and making a preoperative plan for these cases. Also, just given the morphology of this hernia, I think ETEP approach would be unwise and, and dangerous. Again, so I, I really look at morphology of hernias as a determinant for whether or not I'm going to use an ETEP approach. <clears throat> we continued with dissection. Uh, that was that first hernia. This is that peristomal uh, or the prior stoma site that also was somewhat of a hernia. This dissection we carried out all the way to the lateral sidewall, but just showing the importance of again really reviewing your anatomy on CT and being able to identify all the areas of adhesions. She was having obstructive symptoms at baseline, so we took down all adhesions and made sure that there was no. <clears throat> other sources for lead points of obstruction. So after taking down all the adhesions, we then move forward with retrorectus dissection, uh, starting on the patient's left side, and then uh, working towards the hernia. This was going to be the more challenging dissection <coughs> of the two sides because of the old ostomy site and all the other things going on there. So <coughs> we knew this was going to be hard, but uh, we planned for it. So in terms of this special this operation, um, I knew I was going to do a bilateral TAR, a 17 centimeter defect, uh, ostomy site hernia, and all the other things going on. I knew that she would need wide mesh reinforcement. I try to preserve as much of the posterior tissue as possible to make sure that the, my visceral sac has no tension. And so you'll see me going medial to this ostomy site hernia rather than going uh, lateral to it again. It's going to buy me at least a few centimeters of tissue, sac, and other things for my visceral sac. 
Once we're beyond it, we get back into a better retromuscular space and dissect out here. And we work this dissection all the way down to uh, the retropubic space, just given the complexity and size of this hernia. And prepared ourselves to go ahead and initiate our tar. Whenever at all possible, I like to do a top-down tar. I find that it's an easier way to teach the tar, so that's one of the reasons why. And to develop that retromuscular space. As we saw in her CT, a lot of her rectus width was underappreciated because of that rolled up rectus. As soon as you release that posterior sheath, you get a lot of medialization of the linea alba already. Uh, but we still needed more, uh, just given the complexity and size of this room. So again, what you're seeing here <clears throat> is the medial aspect of the rectus, and we're approaching that peristomal site, but rather than going in uh, where it's hard, I, I wanted to go ahead and initiate our tar. We knew we were going to have to do it, and so go where it's easy, really develop the dissection all the way to the neurovascular bundles and the semilunar line, and then prepare to do a tar rather than going and trying to uh, approach challenges in that retrorectus space by the ostomy site. So our left-sided tar, identify the posterior lamella, incise it, and then take the muscle fibers. As we go cephalid and near the preperitoneal fat, I'll, I'll go medial to just simplify the dissection. And so the muscle is released, and then we start working down towards the prior ostomy site. Here I'm just trying to show that the ostomy site, um, we were able to recruit some of that hernia sac. It's not much, but these little winds go, I think, a long way. It doesn't take a lot of effort to do this, but it does give you extra tissue to minimize that potential for posterior tension. And so we continued with all of this. We clearly had a nice tar and uh, had a nice loose posterior flap. And then we started asking ourselves, what can we do from this side of the bed? So it was going to be very difficult to address any of these hernia sacs and or this, this ostomy site once we redock. So we go ahead and close as many of the things that are going to be issues as possible from this side. So the first one is the <clears throat> prior ostomy site, uh, integrating anterior fascia as well as hernia sac to kill this space. <clears throat> and then the second thing I did was placate that large inception hernia. So you can see that this is only a small component of the very large hernia that we're dealing with. And so what I'm going to do here is try to minimize integration of linea alba into this plication. And what we're really trying to do is just kill the potential bed fit space for a seroma. And so you'll see that I'm not integrating linea alba into this closure. I'm just trying to kill the dead space, maximize that potential for uh, tissue mesh interface once we get that mesh on eventually. And minimize seroma. So then after that, we redock onto the patient's left, and then we'll do the contralateral retromuscular dissection and then start with the process of posterior closure 
defect closure and mesh placement. So this contralateral side was a lot easier. Able to move forward with our standard retromuscular dissection without much problem. We'll eventually unify this plane. I think on this side, one of the things that's really nice to appreciate is just how rolled up the rectus were. And then we were able to gain a lot of uh, medialization just by releasing this posterior sheath. You can see the rolled up rectus there. <clears throat> and then we do a standard retro rectus leading to a tall. All right, and then on this side, again, same as last side, go through the posterior lamella, make sure to protect the neurovascular bundles, and then go through the muscle. That continues all the way down until you're at like the tendinous portion of the TA. Those small fenestrations are related to our prior um, eight millimeter trocars that will close. And then we have a very loose visceral sac that will allow for easy closure with no tension on that posterior. <clears throat> a lot of discussions of late whether or not we need to reapproximate the sheath or just have a visceral sac closure. Uh, for robotic cases, I, I really don't tempt fate, and I just do a visceral sac closure, especially in a patient like this. I don't think the cosmetic benefits of sheath to sheath are really worth it, and I do not want to have to risk any uh, posterior breakdown. So an easy closure of the posterior. You can see that it's flopped right over the viscera. There's no tension. And now we'll proceed with defect closure. You can see that we extended the dissection well into the uh, retropubic space. And you see a large hernia even after plicating that other hole. For this case, I actually ended up using a suture I've never used before, Stratafix. Uh, our hospital, halfway through the case, decided to inform me that we were out of my standard VLOX. I use a number one permanent VLOC for these cases, and they were out. Uh, they only had O uh, permanent and or uh, O absorbable VLOCs, and wanted something that would allow for a little better ability to pull on the suture. And so they recommended Stratafix, and I must admit, I was actually very pleased with it. I think this is going to become a new addition to my ab wall set, number one, Stratafix, it's PDS, so it really works and handles nicely. And I found that I was able to actually really reapproximate and pull tissues together even better than with a <clears throat> VLOC suture. So I, I actually really like the way that it performed. After we reapproximated all the muscle, moved forward with mesh placement, we developed a nice space for this patient, easily accommodated with 30 by 30 uh, mesh. And then we used a tissue spray just for some additional fixation to the posterior and placed a drain. I used to upsize my 8 millimeter trocars to 
accommodate the 30 by 30 mesh, but fortunately through uh, international hernia collaboration, I uh, learned a few tricks from Abhishek Parmar about how to roll that mesh up nice and tight, get it through the eight. Case went great, uncomplicated course. The patient was discharged about two days after surgery and uh, look forward to hearing your remarks.